It has been said that some people are so poor that all they have is money. Today's parable is going to expose our view of money in one of the most surprising of ways. And so we come to what I think is one of the hardest, maybe even one of the strangest, of all of the parables that Jesus taught. And so we continue on in our series that we've entitled Parables, Stories That Read Us. And I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 16. It's on page 74. Page 74 in the New Testament, Luke chapter 16. And we're going to read together from verses 1 to 15. Now, the NIV calls this parable the parable of the shrewd manager. Obviously, there were no titles in the original. That's what the NIV translators have decided to call this parable. Other versions call this man the dishonest manager. Others call him the unjust steward. But I think you're getting the picture. Whatever we call him, there's no way to cover up his fraudulent conniving. But what's really going to shock you this morning is what Jesus seems to say about him. So fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. Luke chapter 16 from verse 1. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, You will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever's dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, Or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men. But God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. So, as we come to look at this parable, we see a wealthy man who owns a considerable amount of arable land that he rents out to tenant farmers. So these are farmers that don't have their own land, so they need to rent it from this uh, big boss. And this owner has put a manager in charge of the whole operation. This manager is in charge of the, uh, the, the tenants, he's in charge of all the leases. And in those days, we need to understand that a manager was given authority, a huge amount of authority, to act on behalf of the owner. So whatever the manager did was as if the owner had done it himself. It was a position of incredible responsibility and incredible trust. But we quickly learn as we get into this parable that this manager is a corrupt rascal who's somehow ripping off his boss. We don't quite know how. Maybe it was through some kind of wasteful mismanagement. Maybe it was embezzlement. But Jesus calls him in verse 8 a dishonest manager. And so like all dishonesty, it probably started in small ways, in subtle ways, just a little bit of underhanded stuff here. But over time, this thing developed into something a lot bigger. 
And eventually his shady ways catch up with him and somebody in the community reports him to the boss. And that's how it worked in those days. Loyalty and relationships was really, really important. This indicates that the community saw the, the, the boss as a, as a good man and uh, somebody goes and reports his manager to him. And so we read in verse one that there's a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possession. So his boss calls him in, in verse two, and he asks him a very insightful question. He says, what is this I hear about you? Now, I think that that's a great question to try on your kids at lunchtime, especially if you've got teenagers. Just sit down at the lunch table and just say, what's this I hear about you? And they're going to be panicking. If you've got siblings, they're going to be looking at each other. They're going to think, did mom and dad hack my Instagram account? Was it a teacher that phoned? You know, are you, did you rat the, you know, what's going on here? It's a great question. Just see what they confess. Just say it and just, uh, you can come for counseling afterwards, but just see what, they, what comes out. So the same thing with this manager. He doesn't want to divulge information that the boss might not know. He doesn't know what the boss knows or doesn't know. And so he actually is a very wise guy. He just zips his mouth and says, well, the best thing for me, I have the right to remain silent. Anything I say against me may and can be used in a court of law. And so he we don't read of him responding in any way. He just remains silent. And so it's his boss that breaks the silence and says, give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Oh boy, my boss must know more than I thought he knows. I've been caught red-handed. I've been caught with my hand in the till. My shady past has caught up with me. I knew this day would come. What now? In fact, I'm fired I've lost my managerial position. I'm going to be out on the streets. I'm going to be homeless. And this is what Kenneth Bailey writes. He has done extensive work amongst the Bedouin people. And when he reads them the parable, they interpret it in ways that we in the West don't often. And so his books are incredible insights into how to understand parables. But anyway, Kenneth Bailey writes in his book, he says, if the rascal has time, he will embezzle more. Okay? Legally, his authority as an agent, because remember he's a, he's a letting agent on behalf of his boss, he, legally his authority as an agent is immediately cancelled. At the same time, more generally speaking, his dismissal is in progress. And he still has some room to maneuver until he turns in the account books and leaves the building because word of his dismissal is not out. Ah. Uh-huh. The unjust stewards amongst us are concocting some plans now. But his boss has had enough of his wheeling and dealing, and he says, right, time to surrender the books, turn them over. And the listeners of Jesus' parable, as well as you and I, might have expected him to be silent after that first question. What's this I hear about you? Oh, I'm not going to say too much. But we don't expect him to be silent after he's told that he's fired. We expect him to defend himself. We expect him to speak out now and maybe do some blame shifting. Actually say, well, actually, boss, you've been a terrible guy to work with. Maybe we expect him to shout out some kind of soap opera ending parting shots. No, you can't fire me. I quit. But to our amazement, he still remains silent. In fact, we read in verse 3 that the manager only speaks to himself. So this is internal speaking. If you remember back to your Shakespeare days at school, this is what we call a soliloquy. Soliloquy, he is speaking to himself, but we get to hear his thoughts, and his silence speaks volumes. In an indirect way, he's saying, I'm guilty. I actually can't cover it up. There's no point in trying to defend my behavior. My my master knows everything. My job is gone. I can't get it back. All I can do at the moment is focus my energy towards the future. That's where I'm going to focus. I'm going to focus towards the future. And so he says to himself, what shall I do now? My master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I've only ever done office work behind a desk. I've never even so much as broken a nail. I mean, I'm not strong enough to get a job digging and begging, standing at the robots in Johannesburg with the cars going past Oh, that is so beneath me. So we see something of his entitlement. Isn't it interesting that entitlement often goes together with corruption? This rat of a guy is too ashamed to beg on the street corner, but he wasn't ashamed to steal. This rat of a guy says he's too weak to do manual labor, but he wasn't too weak to get rich at the expense of other people. He had quite a bit of strength there. 
wheeling and dealing. But then this dishonest manager has a light bulb moment. The Greek word at the beginning of verse four is the Greek word egnon. It's kind of like, ah, I know, it's like enlightenment, it's like eureka, the light bulb went on, ping. And like a burst of daylight through the clouds, he concocts a crazy scheme so that when he walks out of that office for the last time, he is set up and he won't end up homeless. So it dawns on him, this is what dawns on him, nobody knows that I've been fired yet. I'm the only one that knows and the boss knows, nobody else knows, this is brilliant. And so look what happens. He knows that he only has a small window of opportunity to hatch his plan. He has to act now before he hands over the account books and leaves the office and here's his plan in verse four. He says, I know, Egnon, Egnon what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he calls in each one of his master's debtors we only given two of the examples, but we have to believe that he actually ended up calling up all of them, and they all came in. So the first guy comes in, and he says, well, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil. He says, okay, well, let's just give you a half-price special. Let's just make it 400. Then he asks the second, how much do you owe? Oh, a thousand bushels of wheat. And I can tell you, let's just drop it by 20%. Let's make it 800. So this steward is very shrewd. He knows how to work this principle, particularly in those days of like, look here, I'll scratch your back and then you scratch mine. So to win friends and influence people, he reduces the debts that are due at harvest time. So if we understand something about agreements in those days, particularly in this kind of context of renting out land, the agreement was signed up and then each of these farmers would pay only at harvest. The amount owing was only due at harvest time and they would give a portion of the harvest, a portion of the crop, that finance, that money, that crop would go to the boss. And so I want you to see how massive these debts were. The olive oil debt, so this is just the debt that's owed to the boss, never mind of the full harvest that there would be. This is just a cut of that that goes uh, to pay the rent. The olive oil debt was about 3,500 liters of olive oil. That's quite a few salads you're gonna have to make to use that much olive oil. It's the yield of 150 olive trees. Three years wages for the average worker. And the shrewd manager just says, right, let's, let's just take 50% off that. The rent that is owed in wheat from another tenant is enough to feed 150 people for a year. Seven and a half years labor for the average worker and the shrewd manager just says, well, let's just chop off 20%. And I'm sure he slipped in the comment, look, I just want you guys to remember that this was all my idea. You know the old man, well I had a word with him, I mean you're a very good tenant, I had a word with him and can you believe it, he agreed, but just remember that, that this was really my, my, my deal, uh, it's my, my idea. And I think the debtors had no reason to believe that anything shady was going on. Sometimes things would be renegotiated if there was drought or there was crop failure, a, a boss would go back in certain circumstances and the market values of crops and things would change, so he didn't want to see those tenants just go out of business as stock became rare, so prices plummeted or went up, and so some things weren't renegotiated, so this was normal. What wasn't normal is we don't read that there was any drought or any reason. This is the steward taking this upon himself for no apparent reason. But if these debtors had known there was any deception involved, they wouldn't have signed. To do so would be to fall out of favor with a rich man. And in that community, to have fallen out of favor with him, he takes away your farm, he takes away your livelihood. So they, they signed in good faith, believing that the manager is acting as if he is the owner and there's full agreement. So we see the shrewd manager calls them in one by one in case they start talking amongst themselves, figure out his plan. So he kind of keeps them separate. He doesn't even have time to address them properly. We don't read that he called them sir. He doesn't call them friend. He just gets straight down to business. He just, they come in and it's just like, how much do you owe my master? And he even says, right quickly. Because for his scheme to work, he has to finish this plan before his master finds out and the IT department has time to cancel his network password and block him on the firewall. Now, it was standard practice to get the debtors to sign the agreements because then he can show his boss, I didn't crook the books. Here they are. This is a legally binding agreement. The, the debtors in their own handwriting have agreed to this. So it's as good as if you agreed to it. These are massive discounts, but the shrewd manager doesn't care. Why doesn't he care? Well, the money isn't his own. It dawns on him, this isn't actually my money. I'm just the steward of somebody else's money. So 
I get to do what I like with it and it's not even mine. And I'm ready fired, so I've got nothing to lose. I might as well feather my own nest for the future. Now you're ready. Here comes the sucker punch. Here it comes. Here's the twist in the tail that many other parables have and it suddenly hits us between the eyes. Are you ready for it? Luke chapter 16 and verse 8. The master took that wicked servant and threw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's not what it says. That's how some of the other parables end, but it says the master commended the dishonest manager. He commended him. He didn't throw him outside. He didn't judge him. He commended him. What is going on here? Is the steward steward being praised for his dishonesty? Are we being told by Jesus to emulate a thief? That's what Julian the Apostate, who lived hundreds of years ago, said. Christianity is a terrible religion. Its founder is a corrupt and crooked man. And here we have an example. Jesus Christ is praising an evil man. I want nothing to do with that religion. No, the text says the master commended the dishonest man, manager. Why? Because he had acted shrewdly. Not because he was dishonest. While his plan was unrighteous, the plan did reveal his ingenuity. Jesus is not praising, the master is not praising his dishonesty, but his shrewdness, his wisdom in some ways. And we can admire a con man's boldness, a con man's persistence, a con man's brilliant communication skills, and his genius without admiring his dishonesty. In fact, we might hope and wish and pray that that con man could just settle down and use all those great talents and gifts that God's given him to do something good for a change. I remember a con man coming to me when I lived in Howick for about five years in KwaZulu-Natal. I was at the petrol station and this guy walks up to me and he says, hey Justin, how are you doing? I think, I don't know this guy. And he says, and how's your wife Liesl doing? He's a young guy in his early 20s and we start chatting and he says he's from Maritzburg and then we discover that when I spoke at the university in Maritzburg, he must have been there. But only afterwards I realized he was asking all the leading questions and I was actually giving him the answer. He was a genius. And then he said, oh, do you know this guy? Oh, what's his name? He's third year, whatever. I'm volunteering all the young adults' names to him. And then he says, yes, I actually come up here to visit that guy. He owes me money. Do you know where he lives? And I said, no, he's actually out of town at the moment. But you'll never guess, his mother's girlfriend, the guy that owes you money, she works just that one block down, because everything in Howick's on that main street, she works at the Howick gift shop, and you can go and chat to her. And then I left the conversation. That night when I get to Bible study and Calvin's back in town, we're having this conversation. He says, can you believe it? I mean, uh, this guy rocks up at my girlfriend's mom's gift shop and says, I owe, her, I owe him 180 rand. She opens the till, she takes it out, she gives it to him. It's like, this is crazy. Where's this guy? He knew all sorts of stuff about me. And I'm thinking, ooh, I think I told him all this stuff. Um, and then I discover... How did this guy know stuff about me? He walked up the main road to the church, saw my name on the board, Justin went and spoke to the secretary, and she just loved to share lots of stories, and he just said like, oh, I know, oh, Justin, oh, you must know his wife. Yeah, what's his name? Oh, his wife's name is Liesl, and she told him like my whole life history. And then he even said, oh, what car does he drive? No, it's a little blue Fiat Uno with a CA registration number. Here he happened to just randomly be walking down. He sees a blue Uno, and he can walk up and greet me, and the rest is history. Now, as we unpack that story, you have to admire that guy. So much courage, so much persistence, so much energy for 180 rand. For 180 rand, then he'll move on to Moy River, and then he'll come back and he'll knock on my door like someone else did, and I told him his story back to him. I said, your mother can't die twice. Oh, so that's what happens in small towns. But you've got to admire something without admiring the dishonesty because that's the part that I drove around town thinking if I find this guy, I'm gonna, because he's taken me for a sucker, and I don't like that. But this guy's shrewdness, his plan was actually genius. If you really think about it, imagine if he'd used those skills for good. Because now his boss only has two options. What are the boss's two options now? Number one, the boss could go back to all of the debtors and tell them, look, I'm sorry, this is a horrible mistake. He was actually fired. That means all the new agreements he signed are null and void. What's going to happen in that culture? The boss is going to have egg on his face. He's going to be cursed. He's going to be hated as a stingy man. 
In fact, I like to think that he had been walking around town and maybe was in the supermarket and one of the debtor's wives came up and gave him a, a fat kiss on the lips and said, thank you, George, thank you for, for what you've done. And he's thinking, what's going on? Thank you, thank you. And he goes out of the supermarket and people are bumping into him and saying, George, we're gonna have you around for a spit bra on Friday night just to say thank you. And George, our budget has increased. We can now put our kids through varsity. Thank you, George, what an amazing, generous man. So is he now gonna go back? Huh? <laughs> Somebody seems to think so. <laughs> is he now going to go back and break the bad news? Or two, is he just going to keep quiet and go along with it and keep the current state of affairs, but it's going to cost him a massive amount financially, but at least he'll still have a good name. And what about the, the steward? We don't know. It's kind of, this is after the prodigal son. We don't know what happened with the older brother, and we don't know what happened, happened with the steward. Maybe he even got to keep his job. Because at the end of the day, regardless of which option, the steward still wins friends because if he gets fired now, the guy's gonna say, what a bad, horrible boss you've got. Come and live in my mansion. And the master now looks good. So has he really done something bad? Yes, he has, but at another level, phew, his shrewdness kind of gets in the way. John MacArthur writes in his book on the parables and says, the steward took careful advantage of a brief and fleeting opportunity, he manipulated what resources were temporarily in his power to achieve ends that were to his long-term advantage. He used the master's resources to do those debtors immense good. He won their friendship with lavish generosity. He maximized his options because now he had a claim on the kindness of many influential businessmen and he would desperately need it. The steward showed amazing foresight because he wasn't thinking about how to cover or excuse his past transgressions. He was just trying to secure his future. And that's the incredible beauty of why this parable hits us because it's a parable of contrast. Jesus can talk in other places about a thief in the night. He can use evil to get us to do something. He can talk about a man who keeps bullying his friend to open the door to give him bread or a widow who's been treated badly who keeps pestering the judge for justice and he can look at all these situations and say, this is a parable of contrast. If that's the situation, how much more God? If that's the situation that's negative, I want you to take away the opposite, something positive. And here it is. I think this is key to understanding the parable. Luke 16, verse eight, the next verse. Jesus says, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. The opening verse said he gave this parable to his disciples. This is you and me. Yes, we know by the end in verse 14, 15, the Pharisees are listening, but this is primarily for his disciples. Jesus is saying, you and I have the potential to be naive. This is an accusation at us, the people of the light, in saying that you and I can be more naive and less shrewd than the world is in how we use our money and our finances and our resources. He says the people of this world can often be more shrewd and more wise than Christians are in so many areas. And here's a whole sermon in its own right of how the church could be wiser in how we take the gospel out, how we win people to faith. Be shrewd. As Jesus said elsewhere, which is a commentary, be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. And I think we sometimes forget how those two things can go together. And either we become a corrupt as servants or as dumb as doves and we don't think wisely. Ray Steadman says those who live only for this life are often more consistent and more persistent in obtaining their goals than Christians are within their much wider and larger view of life. If you're a Christian, you are saying life is more than 80 years. The future is eternal. We have a bigger view. So why is the world more consistent and persistent in obtaining their goals? Steadman says that a lady said to him once, I came to the place where I decided that I would study my Bible as thoroughly and with with as much effort as I studied to be a real estate agent a few years ago. When I began to put that much effort into the Bible, the book came alive and I've grown so much and I've understood so much since. Think about us, think about the people we know. Those of you that are surgeons or specialists, how many years will we spend studying? What all will we sacrifice to get ahead? How many calories and kilojoules will we burn in pursuit of the things that we love, things that ultimately will not last beyond the grave? 
Imagine if we pursued the kingdom of God with only as much zeal and as much energy and as much effort as the children of this world pursue profit and pleasure, the world would be a different place. John MacArthur says, Surely sons of light bound for eternity ought to be more active, more zealous, more mindful and more wise about redeeming the time, preparing for the future and laying up treasure in heaven. This is hectically challenging stuff. That's what the parables are doing. They're reading you right now. They're reading me. And Jesus' point is this. If an unjust steward can be shrewd enough to have the sense to use his money, his master's money for the future, what about you and I who claim to be righteous? See the contrast. If an unrighteous guy can be this wise, what about those who claim to be righteous? It's a contrast. It's a much more than principle. And so let me just give you a few lessons. I just want to camp on what I think is the main lesson, and then I'm going to give you another two, just one comment on these last two. But the first one I want to camp on a bit, lesson number one, is that money is a vehicle to be used for the good of others. We see this in Luke 16 and verse nine. This is Jesus saying, I tell you, which means now he's making application of what this parable means. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Jesus is saying money is a vehicle to be used for the good of others. We are to use whatever resources God has given us to bless others, to make friends who will welcome us into eternal dwellings. This is what I call the pay it forward principle. There was that movie 10, 15 years ago called Pay It Forward. Will there be people one day when you enter heaven who will be standing there who will welcome you in? Will there be those who will welcome you because your gifts, your money, brought the gospel to them? Will there be people who will welcome you because you opened your home to them in this life and you fed them and you exercised hospitality? Your time blessed them. Those late nights serving as a deacon to manage the church. Your prayers that nobody else saw changed them. Prayers of people that maybe you've never met but that you've prayed for in countries you can't go to. Your spiritual and emotional and financial investments made a difference so that you have made friends who will stand one day and they'll say, welcome, welcome, you are my friend for eternity. Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 20, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but where store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. I love Jesus' teaching. He's a master teacher. It's almost as like, he, are you okay, Monica? Okay, chair's broken. Shame, sorry, and I've just drawn attention to it as well. Just ignore that. <laughs> anyway, it was Mike Combrink and chair number three last week, so it's a hit and miss. Um, where was I? <laughs> Yes, Jesus is a master teacher. <laughs> and it's almost as though he plays into our selfishness. And he says, okay, so you want to be selfish. That's why you're storing up treasures on earth. Jesus is almost saying to us, it's almost like you're not selfish enough. If you were a true businessman, wouldn't you want to invest in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and where a thief can't break in and steal? You're actually not selfish enough. You're keeping this for yourself. That's the point of the unjust steward. When he was living only for the immediate, he got caught. He became corrupt. And suddenly in this moment, while he's still corrupt, he's now delayed gratification for the future and he's actually something commendable in that. And, and, and so there's this, there's this kind of this principle of, of almost saying, all right, if we want to keep it for ourselves, we lose it, Jesus said, but if we give it away, we keep it. There's mystery in the gospel and beauty at the same time. Let me give you an example of this. Some of you may know these two guys that are going to be on the screen, Monty Starks and Brian Brown. They were university students maybe 30 years ago. And while they were on campus, there was a little chapel on campus and these two guys would get together and they would pray, Lord, won't you enable our lives to impact the nations in some way? And God and his sovereignty brought both of them to work at the same church in Atlanta in the US, Perimeter Church, that we have a partnership with. And God laid it on the people of Perimeter to give money and to give time and to release those guys to come to South Africa. 
They met with lots of churches. It seemed like, for whatever reason, God worked in Rosebank and we bit the bullet of saying, hey, we want to be discipled in a deeper way. And they, they really impacted my lives, life. They, they've been out probably 10 times in the last decade. I've been to visit them. And, and they really have got me to think about biblical discipleship, the Great Commission, getting together a group of guys and, and doing life with them in a life-on-life missional kind of way. So I want you to see that legacy. And then you as a church gave money so that I could be enabled to go to Ukraine three years ago to teach at a missionary training center on discipleship. It's a missionary training center that is run by Akadi and Annika Naidenov, and there they are with their family. You as a church, those of you that give, every month a portion of what you give goes to them, every single month to support them. Annika is, is, is a South African, Akadi is a national of Ukraine. Annika's parents, who for many years were members and part of Rosebank before they moved to Durban, had to give up their daughter to go to Ukraine. They had to give up being close to their grandchildren. And when you guys sent me over to the missionary training center, there were a whole lot of young adults preparing to go for the mission field. And, and look at this picture. In this picture is a couple that I'll call Sergei and Irina to protect their identity on the left-hand side there. They were there and they'd only been married like just a couple of months and they're going to one of the most unreached places, a country I can't mention. It's one of the stands, you know, all those stand places. A country that we couldn't go to, to take the gospel and they were so impacted as I lived with them for 10 days even though I couldn't speak a word of the language as through an interpreter they asked about my life and my marriage and tips in ministry as they took those discipleship principles and they said we can't even openly plant a church but we can go and do what Jesus did. They were deeply impacted. And two weekends ago they took this group of kids up into the mountains of the country in which they lived. They had to take donkeys to carry everything up there Many of these children are Muslims. Out in the open, they sent, sent me pictures of some of these spiders that are venomous bites and how God protected them from a spider that was right nearby. And God has been using the gospel in these children's lives. And in this boy, they sent me a picture of him. They said he'd always been anti. He was anti them being there. And suddenly, the day before the camp, he came to them and he said, would it be possible if I could go on this camp? Alone, no friends. And they said, God seemed to be working his life. And he came on the camp. And then last Sunday, this lady on the right-hand side got baptized. She's just finished memorizing Psalm 119, they said to me. And they said she can, she can recite it in 16 minutes with a few mistakes. That's her hunger for the word of God. And I'm showing you these pictures to show you a long link to say that one day, some of these people in these pictures, and what a small segment that is, will be standing and they will be your friends. You have gained them as friends, and they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. It's an incredible thought, and it makes me want to give. That's the thing, this story, because sometimes I don't learn from the positive when Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver. Yes, I agree. I learn from sometimes the opposite, the negative. If I say, Lord, I am righteous, and yet... And that's what we faced when we see evil people in the world sometimes doing good. I think of Muslim neighbors that we had in Cape Town and being so overwhelmed at Christmas when they baked us goods at Christmas and brought it to me. And I thought, I've never done that for them when they're celebrating Ramadan. You see, it's in these opposites that sometimes Jesus wants to expose things. Some of you have offered your four by four vehicles to our young people to go to Mozambique. I was deeply moved. Friends of ours who are members of this church, I'm not going to mention their names to embarrass them, gave their brand new vehicle. I think their new 4x4 that only had it for two weeks. And they said, youth, take it. Strangers, drive our vehicle. And I thought, I'm not sure I would have done that with a brand new vehicle. But they did it. And my own daughters were blessed as a result. They've moved closer to the gospel and closer to Christ. Never mind the missionaries that were visited. Never mind the other young people. Never mind the Mozambicans. Our possessions are just a vehicle that we can use to win friends. Some of you have, have been through the process of adoption and have adopted orphans. The knockers in our church family two decades ago bought a proper, property in Boxton Drive. And they identified, I think it was eight orphans that they wanted to care for, and they've done that over 20 years. Four of them they've adopted into their home. Those are Warren who plays our drums. Those are all his brand new siblings that he's journeyed with over the past 20 years. 
Some have taught Sunday school. Some have volunteered at Rays of Hope. Some of you are deacons and elders managing the church, putting in hours on end. Some of you are counselors. Some of you are doctors. Some of you are plumbers. Some of you are teachers. You're seeking to serve Christ in the marketplace. And I want to say you are making friends and gaining friends who will welcome you into eternity, perhaps in ways you don't even realize. And so Jesus says in Luke 16, 9, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, I don't want us to miss that, so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. We have to use our privileged position while we still have time. We only have this small window of opportunity until all our money, all our possessions, all our time is gone. The story is told of an old German lady. She wanted to assist in the building of a Bible college on the outskirts of Frankfurt. And this was straight after World War II. Frankfurt and Germany lay in rubbles and ruins, boulders everywhere. How would things be rebuilt? And this dear old lady brought her money with hard-earned pride to build and rebuild this Bible college. She had constantly guarded her money during the war and, and now she was coming to invest it in a worthy cause and she was beaming with pride as she brought it and she offered her contribution. And the author who recounts the story writes, how could I tell her she had held this money too long? How did it fall my lot to shock the sensitive soul with the news that her money was virtually worthless? Why had she not read the morning paper or heard the announcement that the new government in Bonn had canceled the currency? That Sunday in June of 1948, a staggering number of Germans committed suicide. Millions lost their savings because the mark had been canceled by their government. If only they had exchanged their money for something that would survive the economic collapse. If this dear lady, bless her, had brought her money sooner, her money could have helped. Too bad she had to hear those disappointing words that her money was worthless. Friends, it's a sobering thought that nobody dies a millionaire. We all die with nothing. Nothing. And we have to use our master's money. You need to think about the ways that you need to use what you have been given while it still has value, before it comes the day when all currencies are devalued, while you still have the means to use it. That's the, the main lesson I want to leave you with. But the last few verses of the, of the parable, I don't want us just to ignore them. Just two final lessons and just one comment on each. Lesson number two, faithful stewardship starts small. Where could you start? Just start small. Look at what Jesus says, verses 10 to 12. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. That's the thing. The steward couldn't actually be trusted with little. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? It's one comment from MacArthur. Very challenging. He says, I've heard people say, if I had more, I would give more. No, you wouldn't. Truly faithful people are generous because of their character, not because of their circumstances. Lots of people who have everything give nothing. A person with meager resources who spends everything he has on himself is not going to become selfless if he suddenly becomes rich. More money will only exacerbate the self-indulgent impulse. That is challenging. Because God wants us to use the lesser thing. The lesser thing is money. The greater thing is spiritual resources. And the third and final lesson from our parable, lesson number three. Don't choose money over God in your heart. Verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus doesn't say, you may not serve two masters. He says you cannot. He says it is impossible to do so. Many people say they love God, but the sacrifices they'll make for money reveal who they truly love. David Guzik, a commentator, asks, so how can we tell who or what we are serving? One way 
is by remembering this principle. You will sacrifice for your God. You will sacrifice for your God, and your God could be possessions, it could be money, it could be career, it could be status, it could be family, it could be anything. He says, if you will sacrifice for the sake of money, but will not sacrifice for the sake of Jesus, don't deceive yourself, money is your God. I think you can see why these parables hit us, don't they? And so Luke closes this section with these last two verses, the end of the parable, verses 14 and 15. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. They were turning up their noses. They were angry. And Jesus said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. Those money-loving Pharisees rejected Jesus' teaching. They got angry. It worked them up, as the parables do even for us, if we're honest. Because they were money-loving, the message hit too close. And we can be the same today. We may justify ourselves before people. People may think we're wonderful. Like the prodigal son's friends, they think he's great because he's got all this cash. But God sees our heart. He judges us with a different set of values. And so as we close, can I ask all of us, what will you do with the time that is left? Will you wait to have your resources pulled out of your clenched fist by death? Or would you not rather open your hand willingly now and say, Lord, I offer, I offer all that I have for you to use, Lord, so that I can make friends for the future? I don't know how many of you have heard of Chuck Feeney. Anyone heard of Chuck Feeney? There's one person at eight o'clock. Good, I'm glad you haven't heard of him because he's only become into the public light in the last three or four years. He is known as the secret billionaire. Over the past 30 years, and I don't think he's even a Christian, so let's learn from this. For the past 30 years, his single ambition has been to give away all of his wealth. He has the equivalent of about 100 billion rand, and that's been his single goal, to organizations he trusts, to individuals, to flood relief, to you name it, and he's tried to keep it a secret, and now the word's gone out. Do you know that so far he has given away so much that he only has... 0.0002% of his fortune left for himself. And this is what he said in a recent interview, one of the first interviews he went public in. I believe strongly in giving while living. I see little reason to delay giving when so much good can be achieved through supporting worthwhile causes today. Besides, it's a lot more fun to give while you live than to give while you are dead. Wisdom from a worldly man. And so the shrewd manager, like Chuck Feeney, saw his impending death. He saw it. His death, I'm fired. It's over. He knew he'd have to give an account for the books. And you and I are sitting here today having heard the parable. And we have a second chance. We're not like the rich fool who this night your life will be demanded and he doesn't have any time to to look at his finances. You and I know that that day of accounting is coming and it's not too late. You're still in a privileged position, and if even a selfish, conniving scoundrel can plan for the future, how much more you and I? And so when we finally turned in those account books, may it never be said of the people of light, they are so poor, all they have is money. May we be rich because we've used what God has given us as wise stewards to gain friends who will welcome us into eternal dwellings. Let's pray together. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you for the power of your word. That your word is like a two-edged sword that, that pierces and divides and exposes things that we wouldn't otherwise see. Lord, if we had slept at home in bed this morning, Lord, our lives would have just carried on. But Lord, we've been here, we've sat under the preaching of your word and this parable, Lord, one that perhaps we shy away from because it's so difficult to understand, has pierced us. We ask that you're, by the power of your spirit, you continue to pierce us. Lord, you've given us so much. You call us to be a blessing to others. And yet, Lord, even with what you've given us, we can be selfish. And Lord, when this shrewd manager realized that actually what he had been given wasn't truly his, there was a freedom that came to be able to bless others. Lord, we know his motives were wrong. And, 
but we ask that you would purify our motives, that Lord, we would do this for the glory of God, for the love of the gospel, for the love of seeing men, women, and young people from around the world in the most unreached places coming to know you. Lord, may it be said of each one of us that as we walk through those gates of heaven, may there be a whole chain of people who have benefited from our lives. Oh Lord, give us the insight and the foresight of this steward to look to the future, to not just live for a mere 80 years, but to recognize that life is more than 80 years. Oh Lord, make us wise in this day and age, we pray, because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.